Well, a question I've asked a lot as I've spoken at various places or when I get phone calls from individuals who want to discuss this is, does it matter where the Israelites are? I mean, does it matter who they are? And uh, my answer to that is yes, it makes a great deal of difference. The reason is God made a covenant with Abraham and through him to Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, and Ephraim, and Manasseh, and his all the seed of Abraham, regarding future blessings and also many specific prophecies about their seed in the latter days. So unless you know where those tribes are, you can't possibly understand prophecy. And the other thing is, it's a tremendous boost to everyone's faith if you can see that God has kept his promises through history among nations, among individuals, and if you can see that God throughout all the millennia since the Bible was written has kept his word, it helps our faith to know that God will keep his word to us in our day and age. Well, also, Genesis 49 contains prophecies about the roles and fates of the tribes of Israel in the latter days, and I do believe we are living in that latter day period. To den- since God does make those prophecies, to deny that the ten tribes of Israel can be found in the latter days or that they exist actually contradicts the word of God. Because God is on record that they will be here. And he, God gave a whole chapter giving us clues on how to find them. So it must be important to him that we do identify them. I believe my book, The Lost Ten Tribes of Israel Found, identifies those tribes of Israel and also traces them through history. But you don't have to take it on faith. You know, quote unquote is the expression you hear many times. I think my book provides the evidence that documents it. Several misconceptions exist about what happened to the house of Israel in 721 B.C. Most people believe three things. A, that all the Israelites went into captivity. Two, that the ten tribes opposed Assyria for about three and a half years before Samaria fell, climaxing their fall. And C, that the ten tribes became lost in history. All of those above statements are false, based on both secular and biblical evidence. I'll begin with a quote from Josephus, a Jewish historian from the first century A.D. In his book Antiquities of the Jews, he states... There are but two tribes in Asia and Europe subject to the Romans. The ten tribes are beyond Euphrates till now and are an immense multitude, not even to be estimated by numbers. That's already an indication that God had fulfilled his prophecies about the seed of Abraham becoming as numerous as the sand of the sea and the stars of heaven. Hosea also, I believe it's in the first chapter, has a prophecy that after Israel went into captivity, God was going to multiply them into an innumerable number which by the time of Josephus had happened. So Josephus knew the ten tribes were not lost as of his time, and that was the first century A.D. He also knew that the Euphrates River was one of their physical borders. We'll get into more of that a little bit later. But educated Jews knew eight centuries after Samaria fell where the ten tribes were, how many there were, and a good deal of information about them. Well, to to back up, what did happen to the Israelites in about 721 B.C.? Uh, and I'll, read, I'll quote a number of scriptures. You don't have to turn to them if you don't want or just write them down. Second Kings 17, 5 to 6 states that the king of Assyria came up throughout all the land of Israel and went up to Samaria and besieged it for three years and carried Israel away and placed them in the cities of the Medes. While the Bible states that the Assyrians went through the land of Israel, it says nothing about them reaching or meeting any resistance anywhere in the land except in the city of Samaria. 2 Kings 17 indicates that the rest of the nation had been abandoned. As as you recall, it talks about when they brought new people in, the place had gone to the wild beasts. So it really had reverted to the wild and had been abandoned by their population during that three-year campaign. The Bible and Assyrian records indicate that only about 27,000 captives were taken from Samaria. Biblical censuses just before this show that Israel numbered in the millions. So where did they all go? To give that answer, we need to back up just a little in history. The Phoenician Empire of about 1,000 to 700 B.C. was in fact the Israelite Empire, which was built under King David and King Solomon, allied with King Hiram of Tyre, and the other cities of Sidon, Byblos, and so forth that are commonly called Phoenician. The Bible notes they practically merged their peoples together. If you recall from the Bible, Solomon had many, many thousands of the people from Sidon coming down to work on the temple, that the Israelites had gigantic work gangs. In fact, Solomon had a draft to send people up north to hew down the cedars of Lebanon and bring them down to the temple for his building projects. So the nations practically merged together. The Bible also tells us they commingled their crews and their navies, that the sailors from Tyre and Sidon showed to the Hebrews the knowledge of the sea and the special navigation skills that they had, by which they were known as famous mariners. And I'll have more on that later, too. 
But history shows their golden age was only during the period that Israel was in the land, from about 1,000 to 700 B.C. Those dates match very well with the rise of David and Solomon to power when that alliance began in around 700 B.C. shows when they were gone from the land. Then Phoenicia reverted to a fairly small power. The Greeks indicate that these people who were called Phoenicians included a lot more than just the city-states of Tyre, Sidon, and Byblos that you'll see along the coast of Lebanon. It in, the Greek names in, the his, in their histories, in Homer and others, record that the Phoenician term was applied to the whole east coast of the Mediterranean and included the land of Israel and Judah. Now, the Phoenician Empire had many, many colonies in the Mediterranean Sea area, the west coast of Europe, the west coast of Africa, and into the British Isles at least. Some Phoenician names regularly had the term BRT in it. And uh, BRT, or BRTH, is the Hebrew word for covenant, Berith. Some of you have heard of the Jewish service organization, B'nai Berith. That's sons of the covenant. And BRT is the word that shows they were the covenant people. Well, the Phoenicians were not the covenant people, but the Israelites were. So the fact that BRT was a dominant thread that ran through their alliance shows that the covenant people were proclaiming who they were. Phoenicia had a colony in Britain, which included that BRT designator from about 1100 B.C. or before. Carthage was a Phoenician colony. They had BRT also on their coins. 1 Kings 10, 24-25 says that Solomon had an international empire, and evidence confirms that the Israelite Phoenician empire came to North America. Those of you who have read my book, and some of you have read Mary Fell's America B.C. or Saga America, confirm the evidence of this. You won't read it in the standard history textbooks. You have to know what journals to go to in the colleges and the, the rather arcane archaeological journals and so forth. But the evidence is there. It's just not being passed out to people. The Phoenician Baal worshippers had fairly large colonies in America. As Barry Fell's book points out, they had a large temple to Baal in New Hampshire that's called Mystery Hill. In fact, I've seen it on the Discovery Channel where it showed Barry Fell walking through the ruins of what was left. And frankly, there's not much left because all you have is the basements of these buildings, because when the American colonists came to New England, they were in, as they were building their cities and towns in New England, they needed building materials for streets and buildings. They found this complex of buildings, you know, brick buildings, in, uh, it's on the New Hampshire-Massachusetts border, I think. They disassembled them, and they made their cobblestone streets out of these bricks. Well, when the Epigraphic Society, led by Barry Fell, realized that there were inscriptions at Mystery Hill in ancient Phoenician, Carthaginian, the Celtic languages. They were, they were literally going with, you know, on the bricks that were still left that they could identify had come from that site, and they were looking for inscriptions with their magnifying glasses along the streets or on the sides of building, and sure enough, finding them. Dedications to the pagan gods you read about in the Bible, Baal and Ashtaroth. And so uh, they were over here. These date from about the 2nd millennium B.C. to the 800 to 600 B.C. range. In my area of the country, in Davenport, Iowa, they dug up a New World equivalent of a Rosetta Stone. Remember the three languages that were found in Egypt of where they were able to decode the hieroglyphics of Egypt? A similar stone exists in a museum in Davenport, Iowa to this day. It has three languages. It has the Punic Iberic, which is a descendant of Hebrew, the Egyptian hieroglyphics, and also the language of, uh, when we say Libyan back then, it was really the sailors, the sea peoples of the Egyptians. It shows a maypole celebration. You know, with the fronds coming out from it, but it was a human sacrifice ceremony at that time. And uh, so it's clear that they were still into the uh, rather barbaric rites of the, of the Baal worship. But the worshipers of the true God were here as well. The Ten Commandments were found in ancient Hebrew on a stone tablet in Ohio. It was dug up in one of the mound builders, uh, mounds that, is, that are through the Ohio River Valley. Well, it was dug up in 1860. What, what it showed was that it was a Semitic grave. They dug up a Ten Commandments Decalogue stone inscribed with a picture of Moses, the Ten Commandments in ancient Hebrew. It even had a strap hewn into the object where you could put a, let, or a hole for a strap it's where you could put it over your back and travel. It was probably a, pr a prominent Levite who was buried there with the law in his possession. And uh, also even more impressive is that the Ten Commandments that is carved on a large inscribed stone in New Mexico. I saw it last October, and it's, in fact, there's a picture of it on my website for my book that I'll give you at the end of it. But it's a large stone. It's about this big. It has the Ten Commandments inscribed on it. It's been largely protected from the weather. 
and it's on the uh, pathway up a path to a fairly flat top mountain. But there's around a dozen other Hebrew inscriptions there. One of the associates of Barry Fell took me on a tour of that last October, and some of the inscriptions they hide from the press or vandals and others because they don't want them to mar them. They want to preserve them. One of them is apparently the tribe of Asher. On the very highest part of the mountain, there's an inscription saying, Yahweh is our God. And this is the Hebrew from 1200 to 600 B.C., the Paleo-Hebrew, where they still wrote what, would, what we'd call the Tetragrammaton, the name of God. And in the rabbinic period, they didn't write that. So you can date it that it clearly goes before that period of time. Well, this, why aren't these facts in the history books? Well, this is, this is not God's world. There are uh, powers in this world that until God dethrones them, they do not want the truth out. They want to keep people in ignorance. Now, Britain had been an Israelite colony for about 300 years when Samaria fell. Some tribes sailed for the British Isles. The Simoni, it's in the ancient records of uh, Alan's book, arrived by sea, and he dates it to about 720 B.C. in Wales. The early Welsh called themselves also the Berths or the Berathonic Celts or Celts. There's that BRT again. If I had a blackboard, I'd just write it. You know, BRT, how often this appears in their records. The covenant people. The Phoenicians had been present as miners and as traders, mining tin in that area for many, many years, even before their alliance with the Israelites. The Tuatha de Danann, or part of the tribe of Dan, obviously, arrived as well in the British Isles, principally in Ireland. When Samaria fell, though, most did not go a journey that far. That would have been a pretty rigorous sea voyage, especially if you're bringing your wives and kids with you. A lot went a shorter distance to Carthage, which I'll have more on later too. But I want to give you a surprise, or since you've read my book, probably isn't that much of a surprise to this audience. But evidence exists that most of the Israelites did not go into captivity, nor did they make sea voyages to new lands, but instead migrated via land and conquered a new homeland in the Black Sea region. In 1875, an official of Queen Victoria's British government, Colonel Gawler, wrote a treatise called Our Scythian Ancestors Identified with Israel, citing many classical and medieval sources that most of the ten tribes migrated north of Armenia and became the Scythians or Sake of the Greek records by the Black Sea. Ortelius, who was a 16th century geographer for the Spanish king, wrote that when the Israelites migrated into the Caucasus, they took the name Gothi, which the Romans later called Goths. A medieval Jewish writer by the name of Eldad recorded, and I'm going to read his quote in direct quotes here, many Israelites did not go into captivity, but evaded the calamity, going off with their flocks and turning nomads, and that the chief or prince whom they appointed could muster 120,000 horsemen and 100,000 foot soldiers. So with an armed escort of a quarter of a million men, now if you figure 10,000 for a division, that's quite a few armed divisions going up in terms of armed strength. This mass of Israelites, when you brought their wives and the children with you, the whole mass of people, easily numbered one or two million, perhaps more. The Bible shows several prophets had warned the ten tribes that Assyria would conquer Israel if the nation was going to fall. Since millions left voluntarily, either by land or by sea, it indicates the ten tribes, for the most part, heeded the prophets at the end. And there's a hint of this in the Bible, that Israel was... Uh, was taking an effort back toward God at the time the nation fell. Just before Israel fell for the last time, if you recall, there was a war between Israel and Judah. The Israelites won at that point, and they were carrying, I think it was over 100,000 captives from Judah up towards Samaria. Uh, the men, women, children, etc. So they were a large mass to carry 100,000 into captivity of their own, of their own brethren from Judah. Before they got to Samaria, a prophet of God met them and told them to release the captives and send them back. Well, the king of Israel was waiting in Samaria for all this war booty. I mean, this was a lot of wealth for him, a lot of status to take all these captives. His own people, the Israelites, heeded the prophet. They didn't even consult the king. When the prophet said, let him go, they let him go. And they sent him back with provisions and their clothing and gave them all their material back. That shows, you know, when you've got all that wealth that you conquered and have the right to by right of conquest, you give it all back to your conquest because the prophet of God told you, that's showing a great deal of faith in God at that point. And uh, we'll, in carrying on with that very theme, the, uh, when the Scythians or Sake were located up in that Black Sea region, of course the Sake was, again, I just picture the word Isaac and Sake is S-A-C-A-E. It has the syllable of Sac, Isaac or Itzak right in it. 
fitting that prophecy in Genesis 21.12, that in Isaac will your seed be called, and they carry the name of Isaac with them. Herodotus, the Greek geographer, recorded, of these Scythians, it says, that they make no offerings of pigs, nor will they keep them at all in their country. To the extent Scythia is ever discussed in a textbook, which is very likely very little, uh, it probably does not mention that they were pretty much kosher in their approach to uh, the meats. Idols were singularly absent in Scythian relics. A Scythian king was even executed for participating in a Greek, uh, I think it was a Bacchanalian festival with the riotous, you know, drunkenness and so forth like that. Probably a lot like a Mardi Gras. But anyway, it's actually kind of an interesting story. Herodotus records it, that the Scythian king had adopted Greek ways, and he happened to arrange his schedule, so he was in Athens, I think it was at that time, of the festival of Bacchus. Another Scythian businessman was there and recognized him, essentially dressed in drag, going through the, like the uh, you know, Mardi Gras festival where they dress up in all the bizarre costumes and cross-dress and everything. Well, that was the Scythian king enjoying himself that way. But Scythia was the largest wheat supplier to the city of Athens, so there were Scythians regularly there who were businessmen. He saw through the disguise, and the Scythians hunted down that king and wouldn't stop looking for him till they had executed him for that idolatry because they did not permit that. Uh, a century after Samaria fell, the prophet Jeremiah in chapter 3, 12, or chapter 3, verse 12, gave a message from God to the ten tribes, which is frequently overlooked in the Bible. In that passage, God tells Jeremiah, send it to the north, you know, north being up on a map. If you look in the Bible atlases that you have, you'll see that from Palestine going straight north, you come to the Black Sea which is exactly where these other sources I mentioned said most of the Israelites went. But in that particular message in Jeremiah 3, in verse 12, God actually has some better things to say about Israel, indicating that, uh, that they, had, well, they were not in a state of complete rebellion against God. In fact, they were, at that point, uh, closer to him than Judah. Now, the Scythians gave the Israelite names to the rivers that emptied into the Black Sea when they got there. They used to have Greek names like the Ister, the Borosthenes, and I forget the Tene, I think, and I forget the other one. They gave it the names Danube, Dniester, Dnieper, and Don, all of them after the tribe of Dan, right after Israel got there. In about 624 B.C., Scythia conquered all of Asia Minor, Mesopotamia. They passed through the area of Palestine, were at the borders of Egypt ready to invade when the Egyptian rulers gave them tribute to let them make them leave them alone. But Nineveh and the Assyrian Empire were effectively given the coup de grace as this. They ravaged the land of Mesopotamia. And you can see the revenge motive here, that Israel, who had been driven off its land, would love to come back and do payback to the Assyrian Empire, which they did. But the Scythians were very protective of the Jews in Judah, didn't harm them at all. This would have been during the reign of King Josiah, which is covered in the Bible. Now, you remember the reign of King Josiah? That was when, for some reason, Josiah was provoked into looking for the temple, cleaning it out, looking for the law. What motivated him? Now, if those Israelites were pouring through the land by the hundreds of thousands in that area, of course, it wouldn't have been the whole families, it would have just been the military at that point. But if the Israelites that we know from the records of Herodotus didn't eat pork, they wouldn't tolerate idols, uh, one of the others said that they were jealous of God when they went up there. They heeded the prophet and left. They probably got back to Palestine. Ah, Judah, our long lost brothers here. And they were asked, they obviously were keeping some of the laws of God, and the Jews said, Huh? What do you mean, laws of God? The, the Scythians were probably shocked. Josiah was probably provoked by their presence and what they were saying into looking in the temple. Well, what is the law of God? I mean, he had to have a motive, and the Scythian presence gave him that motive. So anyway, he looked at it, and they found the law, and he read his clothes, and they tried to turn back to God, and they kept one of the holy days, etc. But it's interesting that at the time, secular history tells us that there was a lot of Scythians, or Sake, in Palestine. The Bible, during the reign of Josiah, doesn't call them Scythians, or doesn't call them Sake. But it says, at that time, that Josiah invited the people of Manasseh, the people of Ephraim, the remnant of Israel, or Israel, that were present there at the time of Josiah's reign to join in the Holy Day. And that's in Second Chronicles 34.9 and Second Chronicles 35.18, if you want to write it down, for since the Bible was written from the standpoint of the Hebrew people, it gives the Scythians their old Hebrew names, which were still very well known to the Jews because it only a century had gone by since they left. 
In fact, the Scythians probably originally intended to stay there. You know, they'd heard from their grandparents about the land of milk and honey, etc. They were probably going to recolonize it. But when they got there, of course, the Assyrians had brought new people in, and it was no longer the land of milk and honey. It was the land of weeds and foreigners. And they really did not stay. They only stayed about 28 years, and they figured, forget it, we're going back to the steppes of Russia where they had wide open spaces. The land was fertile. They had plenty of room. Palestine is pretty small. And the Scythian numbers were growing exponentially. They, so they couldn't stay there and left. Now, Herodotus stated that the Scythians were a civilized people. Epiphanius, another Greek, stated that the laws, customs, manners of the Scythians were the standards of civility and polite learning. Now, we are taught in our textbooks that the Greeks and the Romans were the great civilizers, right? I mean, nobody could learn anything unless a Greek or a Roman learned it first, is the general propaganda we get. Many of our textbooks are repeating Greek and Roman propaganda, as I'll get to in just a minute. And... Uh, but this is an example where the Greeks themselves said that the Scythians were the standards of civilized behavior. Where do you think the Greeks got their civilization or some of many of their civilized activities? From the Scythians. Paul, in Colossians 3.11, agrees. He draws a series of contrasts where he mentions the Scythians. Remember he says that in Christ you're neither Jew nor Greek, bond nor free, barbarian or Scythian. So Paul himself was using Scythian as the exact opposite of a barbarian, holding them up as the standards of civility, just what the Greeks said. In 528 B.C., Cyrus the Great of Persia, who I'm sure you've heard about, attacked the Scythians living near the Caspian and Aral Sea. Persia attacked a main tribe of the Sake called the Massa Gatai, which in my book I identify as Manasseh. Scythia was ruled at that time by a queen. Her name was Temaris. Obviously, Tamar is a, one of the Davidic names. David had a daughter, Tamar. That name shows up in among the roots of Judah. So, remember the promise that King David's seed would be ruling over, not Judah, but the ten tribes of Israel? Here we have some of the Israelites being ruled over by a queen with a Davidic name, showing God had kept his promise. Now, this Queen Tamar, as I discuss in my book, was quite an old world version of the Iron Lady, Maggie Thatcher of Britain, who I always had a very high opinion of. But this queen had, was a tough lady, and when Cyrus the Great attacked, she warned him to stay out and told him he would get his fill of blood if he didn't leave. But they tried to keep the peace. Persia was the aggressor. The Scythians said, why don't you go back to your own place, we'll live in ours, and let's avoid all this bloodshed. Persia would have none of it. So they attacked. Queen Tamaris led her army against the Persians. Cyrus the Great lost his life. He was killed there. Most of his army was destroyed which the Greeks record, of this battle. The Massagatai utterly crushed the Persian Empire, and yet you hardly hear about them in, pro in, in any of the history books. We hear about the losers, the Assyrians who lost to the Scythians, the Persians who lost twice to the, Scythi or to the Scythians again. And uh, King Darius, then of Persia, tried for some revenge in about 512 B.C. He led an army, bigger one this time, they had more respect for Scythia now, he led an army of 700,000 over in the Black Sea region of the Scythians. He didn't try to fight those ones on the east anymore. He went over to the west side to see if they were a little softer. Well, they had different tactics, just like the Russians used against Napoleon or against Hitler. They just had scorched earth. They pulled back into the immense, they filled in the wells behind them, gave nothing to the Persians. They extended their supply lines eventually too far, and it became untenable, and they all had to retreat. But the Persians lost 70,000 men in that particular engagement. Now, that's about what the United States lost in 14 years in Vietnam. And Persia lost that just in one campaign, lasting a few months. The uh, one thing I do want to mention about this is the eagle was a common Scythian symbol and a clump of arrows being held in the talon of the eagle. Can you think of a modern, Amer modern country in the world that has its eagle crest with a clump of arrows as its war sign? The United States which I identify as Manasseh, and that was the Massa Gatai of, of Scythia, had the same image. Now, Daniel's great image in Daniel 2 needs to be understood not as a prophecy about all the world empires. It's a prophecy about the Gentile world empires of Babylon, Greece, Persia, and Rome, because the Israelite empires frequently were as great as those Gentile empires and frequently defeated them, as we'll get into later. Now, I want to shift the focus to Carthage. 
in the, you probably have images in your mind of Hannibal marching the elephants across the Alps, etc., and that's about where it ends. But in the mid-9th mid century B.C., Israel and Phoenicia were devastated by the drought, which Elijah prayed for. Now, it's interesting. God didn't tell Elijah, I've had it with these people. Send a, I'm going to send a drought. No, it was Elijah that said, Elijah had had enough with the people, and he sent the drought. He said, I accept by my word. There will, didn't say God's word. He said, by my word, there won't be any rain. God honored it. Elijah was that close to God. But... The lesson here that we have is that Phoenicia and that whole area of Israel was drying up. I mean, every people were starving to death. They had, if, you, if you were one of those people, would you stay and starve? Or would you get on a boat and go to one of the colonies where you had plenty of food and you weren't going to starve? Well, it was a no-brainer. So anyway, a lot of people left. That's when Carthage had its huge infusion of population was during the time of Elijah's drought. But there's a lesson here. God did not, he hid Elijah from Ahab and Jezebel. In fact, he hid him in Zarephath, which was a suburb of Sidon, the hometown of Jezebel, where she never would have dreamed of looking. But God caused Elijah to go through the same conditions that he asked God to send on his nation. First, he went out in the countryside. Remember, the ravens fed him by a brook. Then it dried up. So he got to see the suffering in the countryside. Then God said, okay, get thee to Zarephath. And he took him over to a, you know, this widow and the son. Remember that they thought they were going to die, and God kept them alive miraculously with just a little bit of oil and a little bit of grain. So God had Elijah see the suffering in the city. Three and a half years went by, and Elijah still didn't give the word to send any rain. He must have really been angry at him. <laughs> in fact, God is the one that put an end to it. His mercy entered the situation before Elijah. Elijah was still going to go on. God said, this is enough. I'm going to send rain. You know, he arranged the confrontation with the prophets of Baal at that point. But there's a lesson in here that we have to be careful what we pray for our nation because you're going to get it yourself often. You know, as you sow, so shall you reap. With what judgment you judge, you'll be judged. And so anyway, uh, if, if a person prays, well, just punish our people, Lord. They're just a bunch of sinners. You know, send them into captivity. Well, that's scary language because God says, okay, if that's what you want, but if, on the other hand, if you're like Moses on the mountain and you intercede for the people and you say, spare your people, O Lord, forgive them, deliver them from their enemies, you're more likely to be delivered yourself. And uh, as an aside, in Amos 6, there's a good commentary on that. It talks about people that are, it says they're drinking wine in bowls and listening to music, having a good time. And it says, but they're not grieved for the affliction of Joseph. It says, because of that, they will be among the first who go into captivity. So God does expect us to have an attitude of concern and be watchmen for our people. But moving on, the name Carthage comes from Roman sources. Carthage never called themselves that. If they could be resurrected now and we said, oh, you're Carthaginians, they'd say, who? You know, they, their real name was Kiriapatisha, which was Hebrew for a new town. The leaders of Carthage were called by a title of one of the books of the Bible, the Shofetim. For those of you who know Hebrew, that's judges. You know, and the, the leaders of Carthage called themselves judges because they were not kings. They didn't take that title until after the kings of Israel fell. Carthage was a crown colony, just like Canada, Australia, New Zealand. You know, were crown colonies of Great Britain during when their kings had real power. The priests of Carthage were called the Kohanim after the Kohens. The term rabbi was noticeable. Historians state that the sacrificial rites bore a very significant resemblance to the book of Leviticus. The Encyclopedia Judaica also acknowledges that Hebrews, or Israelites, from Palestine were with the, uh, the Phoenicians when they founded Carthage. Carthage grew strong and rich. They had such a powerful navy that for centuries they forbid the Greeks and Romans to even go out into the Atlantic. That was their private playground and their private domain because they exploited the Atlantic world for their own wealth. And Carthage was known as an incredibly wealthy city. Carthage had Gibraltar, or as they call it, the Pillars of Hercules. That's one of the gates of their enemies, which is one of the promises that God gave Abraham for his seed. Frederick Pohl's book, Atlantic Crossings Before Columbus, quotes two Greek accounts of Carthage's secret Atlantic land. So they learned about it, they just couldn't go see it. One is a fairly respected source, Aristotle. He states, in the sea outside the pillars of Hercules, the Carthaginians found a wilderness with navigable rivers. Carthage, the master of the Western Ocean, which meant the Atlantic, 
observed that many people attracted by the fertile soil and pleasant climate resided there. Carthage decreed no one else under penalty of death would be allowed. To, no one else under penalty of death would be allowed to sail there. They kept the land secret. Another Greek writer wrote, "There lies a very great island in the vast ocean, many days sail westward from Africa. The soil is fruitful, a great part of it is mountainous, but there's a large plain watered with several navigable rivers, you know, the Mississippi, the Missouri, the Ohio, etc. The mountainous part is clothed with very large woods." Well, obviously, this is North America. And the Greek histories also record that the Carthaginians sent fleets with tens of thousands of settlers out through the pillars of Hercules. They assumed they were going to colonies in Africa or Europe, but frankly, there isn't a population base there to indicate that that is where they went. And uh, now, through the work of Barry Fell and the Epigraphic Society, we know a lot of those colonists came to our side of the Atlantic. Carthaginian coins, writings, and artifacts have been found in Colorado, New York, Alabama, Georgia, Connecticut, Nevada, and other places. But why is this fact? Why are these facts not in textbooks? Well, obviously it's being suppressed. We're in a Darwinian evolutionary society. They don't want anything out there that supports the Bible or gives credibility to it. They want to defend their God, natural selection. And but the fact is. The Phoenicians and Carthaginians sailed the oceans for centuries. They knew the world was round about a millennium before the Greeks learned it. So we have this myth that the Greeks were the founders of all civilization. In fact, the Phoenicians and Carthaginians would be just absolutely amazed if they could be resurrected now and see that their ancient propaganda was being taught as facts because the Greeks got this world is flat notion from a disinformation campaign from the Phoenicians and Carthaginians. They knew the wealth that was out on the other side of the Atlantic and other places. They wanted to scare everybody else away. So they invented those maps you see in the ancient world where it shows these monstrous sea, sea creatures that would just gobble ships, you know. So the Carthaginians invented that to scare their enemies off the ocean so they could have a monopoly. And they knew, they knew, they, had, they understood latitude and longitude. They knew how to navigate with the trade winds and the currents back and forth across the oceans with no difficulty. But uh, the Greeks, for example, were so ignorant of this that at one point the Carthaginian navy, which usually blocked the pillars of Hercules, was gone on a war. A Greek sailor from Marseille, France, named Pythias, sailed through the pillars of Hercules and started going north in the direction of Britain. He was absolutely amazed to see that the constellations changed position in the sky further north he went. He went back and told the Greek world, the earth must be round. Or that the positions of the stars is changing. It's like I'm sailing on a sphere going, you know, they all laughed him to scorn and said, no, of course you know it's flat. And so that's where our great Greek civilization also uh, was deceived by the Carthaginians. Well, Carthage did have an entire civilization here. Historians discuss two mysterious civilizations in ancient America. The Adena people, who inhabited the Ohio River Valley, they can identify from about 1,000 B.C., Onward. Now that's the time of King David and Solomon when they were sending fleets across the ocean until they merged with the Hopewell people around 300 to 200 B.C. They died out centuries later, but 300 to 200 B.C. is a key time as well. That's the time of the Punic Wars when the Carthaginians were losing to the Romans and more of their people left for their colonial system as refugees. Uh, the Epigraphic Society also has a quote that I put in my book that uh, Presidents Jefferson and Harrison were about the Naman builders. They were wondering if these weren't built by the lost tribes of Israel. And one of the artifacts in an Adena grave was translated by Barry Fell as Punic in the form of an alphabet used in Iberia, that was in Carthage's territory, in the first millennium B.C. It was a language of Carthage which was from the Hebrew. So as soon as they found out that, oh, there's Semitic goods in these mounds, we don't want to dig up anymore. You know, the establishment didn't want to find out anything more there. There were Semitic names and grave goods. They even had copper hides. Those of you who, you know, they were, it was a form of ancient currency. It was a copper that looked like a rectangle with hooks on it. And uh, they've even dug those up in American sites. But next I want to discuss an Israelite empire that rose to power in Asia. If I asked you what nation declared its independence from a powerful empire, had its revolutionary war and celebrated their Independence Day as a national holiday, became a superpower, and pioneered a great deal of freedom for their people, what nation would you answer? Well, obviously, the United States. But 
In the ancient world, Parthia is the correct answer for all of those questions. There's a remarkable parallel. The Scythians and the Parthians were related tribes. The Greco-Roman historians are very clear on this. Greek history states that the Parthians passed from the dominion of the Assyrians to that of the Medes to a position under the Persians from which they became independent. And that aptly describes what happened to the Israelites who did go into captivity. And frankly, a lot of them did because remember the Assyrians, although they took only 27,000 from Samaria, they took most of them about 20 years earlier when they took all of Gilead, which is Gad, Reuben, half-tribe of Manasseh, the entire tribe of Naphtali, and pieces of Issachar and Zebulun up by Galilee, the Bible says, in that particular area. So a lot of those did go into captivity. Places. Obviously, Isaac. God promised King David also in Jeremiah 33, his seed would be ruling over the house of Israel. David was of the line of Perez. We can see that when we look in the, you know, the begat section of the Bible. The Parthians and Scythians were ruled by kings with the name of Perez. Kings of Iberia in the Black Sea area of Scythia were called Perez Menes. A lot of them had the term Perez right in their name. The Parthian sub-kings in the area of India had Gondophorus or Gondophores. That name is sometimes associated with one of the three wise men. was ruled in the area of West India. Now recall that the Hebrew word for covenant was BRT or BRTH. Historical sources and linguists state that the ancient Semitic tongues were interchangeable in some of the letters. Now, P and B were very interchangeable. The Greeks did this a lot. A linguist would tell, call it it's a labial consonant. You know, if you can make P or B, you make the sound with your lips. Very similar. And so that we get the term Parthia from Greco-Roman sources, but if, if you change the P to a B, the consonants of Parthia is B-R-T-H. Again, the covenant people, right in their name. We know the Greeks did this because at, for, at times they called the Britannic Isles with a, with a P, the Britannic Isles. So if you're consistent with Parthia and Brithia, which is probably what they were really called, we can see an Israelite name. They grew too numerous to count in Asia, as Josephus says, and they eventually became known by their clan or subtribal names. Numbers 26 gives us those subtribal names. And uh, have you ever decided to read the Bible through in a single year? And, you know, you set your schedule and you say, well, I need to read so many chapters, so many chapters a day. Okay, you start in Genesis, that's interesting. Yeah, Exodus is pretty good. It gets a little slower when you read through all of those laws of the sacrifices and so forth. And then you get to Numbers 26. And you start in that area, it's so-and-so begat so-and-so, and so-and-so begat so-and-so, and that person begat so-and-so and begat sons and daughters, and they begat so-and-so, you know, and it's easy to fall asleep. That's about where my resolution stopped. I remember years ago when I tried that. And frankly, if you're reading the Bible for, you know, some remarkable inspiration or doctrine, you're not going to find it in Numbers 26. But for a scholar tracing the Israelites, these are absolutely invaluable because those names surface in history. You can find them, and without that information, it would be almost impossible to trace them. So God knew what he was doing in that part of the Bible. And Ephraim's subtribes in the Bible are called the Iranites, the Bactrites, and the Tehanites. The three tribes that formed the backbone of Parthia were the Iranians, the Bactrians, and the Dahanites. Exactly the names of the three, three of the major clans of Ephraim. The Iranites lived in the cities of the Medes, which is where, where we know a lot of the people from Samaria were taken while well, they were Ephraimite from Samaria. The Ayatollahs of today's Iran would be most upset if they knew that in the English language the name Iran comes from Iran, one of the names of the sub-clans of Ephraim. So Iran, when you see it on a map, that's an Ephraimite name, where Parthia used to be. Parthia was formed by the sub-tribes of Ephraim, rejoining with other tribes, and Scythia's chief tribe was Manasseh. They were the chief tribes of two separate concurrent empires. Often Manasseh, Scythia, came to the aid of Ephraim in wars against Greece or Rome, just like Manasseh, the United States, comes to the aid of the British in wars in World War I and World War II. In the 1870s, the famous English historian George Rawlinson wrote this following quote. He states, The picture of the world during the Roman period was defective in omitting Parthia, a rival state dividing with Rome the sovereignty of the known earth. From first to last, there was always in the world a second power which balanced Rome. This power, for several centuries, was Parthia. Parthia declared its independence from the Seleucid Greeks around 250 B.C., 
It grew into an empire, conquering Persia, Media, Babylon, other Asian kingdoms. A great Parthian monarch, Mithridates I, did most of the expansion. Rawlinson discusses him very favorably. Have you ever heard, ever heard about him in your history text? You've heard of Alexander the Great, Cyrus the Great, maybe even Ashurbanipal of Assyria. Mithridates I conquered as much as they did, and built Parthia into big empire, but you won't hear a word about him in a history text. He conquered most of known Asia at that time. Strabo, who lived just prior to Christ, a Roman historian, stated that the council of the Parthians consists of two groups. One, that of the kinsmen of the king, in other words, those with the royal blood, and the other, that of the wise men and the magi. Now, we heard that name before, you know, wise men and magi, especially around Christmas time. The Parthian kings were elected by a joint vote of both bodies. The commoners didn't vote. But the kings were not automatically the first, you know, the eldest son. They were elected by a joint vote of the, co of the nobility and the uh, relatives of the king. But they always had to come from the royal house. Just the seed of David is what they were. But the bicameral election of the kings of Parthia is one of the best kept secrets in the ancient world. I mean, this predates the Magna Carta by a long time, millennium, millennium and a half. The Magi, who were Parthia's priests, were the sole inhabitants of many large towns which they governed as they pleased. Well, where have we heard of that habit before and that custom? Remember in Joshua 21, the Levites were given in the Promised Land 48 independent cities that they could govern as they pleased. Parthia had the same custom for their hereditary priests. Many cities were self-governing. Greek cities and Jewish cities were allowed to self-govern themselves with very little interference from the national government. Boy, that sounds good. That's more... <laughs> I mean, that's more freedom than we have in the United States now with a national government that basically tells you an awful lot now through executive agencies. But today we learn history from a Greco-Roman view and ignore the history of Israel's much more enlightened empires. Uh, in 140 B.C., some of the Scythian tribes moved down from the area of the Caspian and Aral Sea uh, and became part of Parthia. One of them was the Nephthalites, obviously the tribe of Naphtali. The most prominent tribe was the Massa Gatai that had defeated Persian, or, uh, Cyrus the Great. These were people that were in Gilead and had originally gone captive. When Assyria fell, they moved up into, and escaped into Russia. Now they were coming back and rejoining the rest of what was Israel. The western Scythians by the Black Sea were still independent. I'm going to give you some information about the Parthian Roman Wars because frank, frankly they're a very fascinating period of time. We have this image you know, in Hollywood cinemas and in history books that Rome was the great conqueror. No one could resist Rome's will. Well, that's not true. Rome was at one point ruled by a triumvirate of Caesar, Pompey, and Crassus. Crassus invaded Parthia, which was the first of many wars of aggression by Rome against Parthia. And this was in about the middle of the first century B.C. Parthia fought Rome with just their heavy cavalry. Their, their infantry, they didn't think that highly of Rome, so they sent the infantry to fight a different war up in Armenia. So the heavy cavalry met the Roman Empire's army, and uh, Parthia fought the Romans in, it was almost like going through a time warp if you had been a Roman soldier, because this is the description of Parthia's heavy cavalry, from Rawlinson again, this is from the Greek sources. The horse's heads, necks, chests, and flanks were protected by armor of brass or iron. Their riders had iron, armor and helmets of iron. They carried a long spear or pike, formed a long line in battle, and bore down on the enemy with great weight. It sounds like the knights of the medieval age, doesn't it? And the Parthians even had jousting, where their knights would you know, line up and try to dehorse each other. And uh, Gibbon's uh, book, uh, I think it's Edward Gibbon in his book, too, comments that the feudal uh, society of, of Europe came right from, it is remarkably common to the feudal feudalism that reigned in Parthia. And in the Dean it did. So in 53 B.C., Parthia killed half the Roman army in Crassus. But we'll notice the difference here, what they did with their captives. You know, when Rome conquered a people, they would drag their captives through the streets of Rome, you know, and parade them with necks around them or chains and, and humiliate them. Uh, Parthia didn't. The captive Roman soldiers that they captured, they, they took them into captivity. If you can call it captivity. They made them free men, gave them land up by the Caspian Sea, provided wives for everybody, and said, you're Parthians now. <laughs> and the Roman state loved it. They became, those particular ones became part of Parthia from that on. And, uh, in fact, many of the provinces in Mesopotamia in these wars, they would fight Rome to get under Parthia's rule, because it was so much more beneficent. 
Well, Parthia counterattacked, and they drove Rome out of Palestine, out of Syria, out of Asia Minor, back across the Bosporus and Dardanelles, and back into Europe. You don't hear about that one in the textbooks either. That was one of the most massive Roman defeats in history. Parthia ruled Palestine for a number of years. They had a vassal king who was uh, ruling over Jerusalem. This was around 40 A.D. at that period of time, and they ruled for a or excuse me, 40 B.C. And they ruled for a number of years. So at the time Christ was born, there were people alive walking the streets of Jerusalem who remembered how much nicer it was to live under Parthia's rule. And they wanted it back. Which is going to also, and the Pharisees did too. Which is going to have some impact on Christ's life here. But at any rate, it's significant to realize that Palestine was ruled by Parthia, the tribes of Israel, just a few decades before Christ was born. Rome counterattacked, and they went back and, back and forth, but finally the Euphrates River became the established border between Rome and Parthia. To cross it with troops meant war. But if you stayed on your side, it was a time of peace. And then for about 80, 90 years, there was a period of detente, to use a modern term, where they did not fight each other. Trade flourished, etc. This is the time when Christ was born. Were they lost? No. Remember, Josephus wrote... After this, that the ten tribes were beyond Euphrates, an exceptionally great multitude. And in naming that border, he was naming the border between Rome and Parthia. And, for example, if we were speaking in Texas, say we were in El Paso, and one of you said, well, I'm going to go across the Rio Grande this afternoon or this, this weekend, we would understand that as an idiom for, well, I'm going to Mexico, because it's such a well-established border. For centuries, the Euphrates was the border between Rome and Parthia. So, and of course, Josephus wasn't writing for those of us in the year 2000. He was writing for his audience then. And when he wrote the words across, you know, across Euphrates, they all understood, oh, in Parthia. But we don't get that because it was an idiom. But anyway, uh, I want to give you some information on the life of Christ in the context of Parthian Roman affairs, because our Savior was a much more prominent individual in the world events of his time than we, give, than we have in our understanding. The Magi, remember, were the ones who chose Parthia's emperors. They even had the power to impeach emperors, to use a modern term, and dethrone them and replace them with somebody else. Some of those same Magi came to worship Christ, and prior to Jesus' birth, Parthia had had a string of very horrible rulers. Because Parthia had the, hap- or had the rule where anyone of the royal blood could become the next emperor, they all saw each other as rivals. So when a male would become emperor... At this particular period of time, they would kill their brothers, their fathers, their grandfathers, their nephews, their cousins, son-in-laws. If they were male, they killed them because they didn't want any rivals. Well, the Magi were responsible for making sure there was still some living, breathing seed of David, the house of Perez, to stay, uh, to stay alive for the next emperors. So anyway, the Magi would take children. Or, or various youths, and they would send them to the Scythians, their relatives up north, other Israelites, during this time of peace. They even sent them to Rome to keep the royal seat alive, to protect them from their own emperors. In fact, they did send to Rome one time for a Parthian to come back and rule them, because they couldn't find any in Parthia. And so anyway, at that particular time, this guy was so Romanized, they had to get rid of him, and they went looking in Scythia to go find the guy they had deposed. <laughs> to bring him back, because it was really hard to find someone with the royal blood, because they'd all been annihilated. So at this particular time, you have the Magi coming to Jerusalem, looking for he who is born a king. And they found Jesus Christ, who had the line of Perez in him. I mean, the the accounts in Matthew, etc., tell us of his Davidic line back to David and the Perez. So that was the royal line of Parthia. And they were looking for this child that they had heard, and of course... They heard from the angel, I think it was the star that led them. But anyway, they were looking for he who was born king of the Jews. They knew he was a royal bloodline individual before they ever got to him. Now Matthew 2, verse 3 says that Herod and all Jerusalem with him were frightened or scared when the Magi came. Now the standard Christmas card picture we have is of three guys on camels, all dressed in royal robes and crowns, you know, displaying their gold and frankincense and myrrh from their saddles. And that just is totally unrealistic when you look at the real world the way it was. If you were traveling with any valuables, you had an awful lot of armed guards. 
guarding that. And you didn't advertise and flaunt your wealth, you know, or your king and royally status. Much less you didn't travel without escorts. Because there was, there was nobles and there was brigands and pirates, you know, of, uh, on the land routes that would, that would rob a caravan. And plus, uh, Josephus tells us that Jews from Parthia at this particular time, when they would send Holy Day offerings to Jerusalem, they would send them ar- escorted by 10,000 armed men. That's how dangerous it was on some of those caravan routes. Jerusalem was a major caravan city. I mean, it was at the hub of three continents. They were used to having co- caravans of tens of thousands of people. Thousands come in routinely. Three tired guys on camels wouldn't have scared the wits out of the city of Jerusalem. Believe me, there was something a lot more to this story than our Christmas card you know, posters that we have of this. Well, the fact was, since these magi and wise men, and I think there was ten of them, or twelve, for all the tribes of Israel, because there was a lot of Jews, and there was more Jews in Parthia than in Judea. I think when they came, they had the right to travel with thousands of escorts from the Parthian heavy cavalry, those mounted knights. They'd have come with their banners flying, etc. They'd have been accompanied by animal handlers and cooks and bakers and, and who knows what else. It was a whole city on the move. And when they, you know, it was a time of peace, so Rome wasn't expecting any attack. They wouldn't have had many troops in Jerusalem, just garrisons for quelling local rebellions. When, the, when they saw coming over the hills the Parthian standards in the, in the sunlight glinting off the armor of thousands of troops, and they remembered you know, that just a few decades before Parthia had conquered Jerusalem and ruled it, when Herod uh, you know, met the wise men, Herod was a very wicked king. Remember, he killed the children you know, under a certain year of age because he wanted to get rid of Christ. And He was a vicious man when you read about him in secular history. Yet he received those magi with utter deference. When, he, when, they, when the Magi came into him, probably escorted by a number of their soldiers, Herod, I think, was expecting terms of surrender. And instead, he heard them asking for help in finding a child. He was probably greatly relieved to hear that. But, but one of the lines, remember, the, the uh, Magi said, Where is he that is born, king of the Jews? Well, the, Par- the Parthians had put up one of their own rulers as king of the Jews, you know, just a few decades earlier. So this could have been a huge insult. I mean, it was an insult to Herod. He could have blown up and said, well, I'm the king of the Jews, off with their heads. You know, if they had just been unescorted, he would have. But he had to treat them with utter deference, and I think that's because they had brought a whole army with them. And uh, so instead of being besieged, they uh, found that they were there to look for for a royal child. And uh, I'm also convinced that the Parthians who came at that point did not just bring one little saddle bag of gold, one little vial of myrrh and another of frankincense. No, with that big a party, they had a whole train of camels and donkeys you know, loaded with saddlebags of gold, incense, spices, all the wealth of the East to bring them bring as their royal gift. In, in a larger sense, it, this was the gift of God the Father to His Son, Christ being born, delivered through the tribes of Israel and their rulers, probably one for each of the tribes. It would have been most symbolic. This made an impression on Rome, believe me, having an army of thousands and thousands coming to Christ uh, to worship him as a, well, of course, it was just the the Magi. They basically snuck out and away from the spies of Herod to go worship the young child Christ in person. But uh, the apostles and the people of Judea at that time, they knew of Christ's royalty. I mean, they called him the seed of David, you know, about son of David, you know, the crowds would call him. They knew he was of the royal blood that was also in Parthia. His own disciples, remember, said, Will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? I mean, they were expecting a messianic fulfillment at that time too. And I honestly see in the actions of the Pharisees to constantly goad him into rebelling against Rome. You know, they, who who should we pay taxes to here? Caesar or God? And he said, well, render unto Caesar, that's what Caesar's, and to God, what is God? Christ never took the bait to lead a revolt against Rome. And it must have been terribly frustrating to these Pharisees. Because, ah, in the book of Daniel, the Messiah is due. Yeah, he should be born in Bethlehem. He's born in Bethlehem. But it says there is, they thought that he was going to be the conquering Messiah. They did not want the suffering Messiah at all. They wanted to be freed from Rome. If Christ had led a revolt against Rome, the Pharisees would have been his biggest backers. And I think they were trying to... Re- er, they, they said, no, Christ, your, your role is to lead a war now. You know, Peter went around with a sword, lopped off somebody's... He was trying to lop off the head of that one individual, not just cut his ear off, you know, in Gethsemane. I mean, so even his own disciples were expecting a messianic... They all fled when Christ died. What happened? 
We're supposed to get the conquering Messiah. That's what they thought too initially. And, uh, well, i got to move on and give you some information on the missing years of Christ's life from between age 12 and 30. Remember at age 12, Jesus, the young Jesus was putting in awe the temple teachers, you know, in the temple, and they were marveling at, at his wisdom. That's in Luke 2. The common assumption then that we usually have, though, is that Jesus lived as an obscure carpenter up in Galilee, banging nails for 30 years, and then burst on the scene as the Messiah at age 30. Well, that does not fit with the Bible at all. 1 Thessalonians 5.19 says that we are not to quench the Spirit, right? And if we're not to, certainly Christ wouldn't have done that. If his spiritual power was burning so brightly that at age 12 he was already excelling the wisdom of of the greatest teachers of the law in the temple, he would have had to quench the Spirit for 18 years to go back and be an obscure carpenter, and he didn't do that. And indeed, I think we see a declaration of independence really on Christ's part when his, you know, he didn't even tell Joseph and Mary where he was. Now, at age, at a, consider the culture. A 12-year-old boy does not wander around alone on his own in Jerusalem at that point, much less not tell his parents where he is when they're going back to Galilee. I think he was with Joseph of Arimathea, his great uncle, who was a very respected person in Jewish society, may have been part of the Sanhedrin, and would have had easy access to the temple. And as a 12-year-old, he could have gone with him because he would have been uh, one of his mentors. But uh, I, even speakers lose their place. I've got to find where I am here in my paragraph. Okay. But apparently Joseph, the human father uh, that's called the father, died soon after Jesus' 12th birthday. We don't hear any mention of him after that. And ordinarily, Jesus, as the oldest son, would have had to take up the father's trade to support the family. But remember, he didn't have to. He was exceptionally wealthy. Remember all those gifts of the Magi? There were riches. Well, Joseph of Arimathea was an exceptionally rich individual, a traitor in his own right. And as his great uncle, he probably kept that in trust for him until he was of age, at least bar mitzvah age, to handle it on his own. So Mary and and the family would have been well provided for. Jesus would not have had to stay there. Joseph of Arimathea was both a prominent Jew and a Roman citizen. My book offers evidence he was a Roman official in charge of a mining district in ancient Britain. Uh, Joseph would have been gone from Judea for lengthy periods of time uh, due to the trade routes on the world. He would have been very familiar with the maritime routes. My book makes the case that Jesus, soon after the age of 12, went with Joseph of Arimathea and worked with him as an apprentice in his international trading business. This would have been totally consistent with Jewish culture because of his you know, human father, Joseph, died. He would have been essentially apprenticed to whatever the business was of his nearest male relative, which was Joseph of Arimathea, as far as we know. When he began his ministry at age 30, remember his hometown synagogue struggled to identify him? In Luke 4.16, in the Living Bible, it says, it calls it Nazareth, his boyhood home. It didn't say it was his hometown then, it was his boyhood home. And they also said, is this Jesus' son, or Joseph's son, and where did he get such wisdom? Well, at age 12, he had such wisdom that it was glowing so brightly in the temple. If he'd moved back to Galilee... And uh, also, this is really a smoking gun scripture here, that Christ was not in Judea, because Luke 2.52 says that Jesus, after this episode in the temple, it says after that he increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. So if he was going back to Galilee as a 12-year-old, increasing in wisdom and stature with all the men there, they'd have known who he was at age 30, and yet when they... When they looked at him at age 30 and he made an appearance at his hometown synagogue, they said, who is he? Do we remember this guy? You know, so obviously Jesus had not been there in those 18 years. His hometown barely knew him. And so he had to be with Joseph of Arimathea, and he would have been allowed to travel wherever Joseph's business would have taken him. Remember, this was a time of tremendous peace between Parthia and Rome, and they traded with each other. You can find Roman coins in Parthia. I read in a book just yesterday at a marvelous library here in Detroit that Parthian coins have been found in Britain. So there was trade back and forth. One of the objects, one of the classifications of trade goods that Parthia really wanted from Rome was metal and metal work. You know, metal, things were manufactured. Well, that was Joseph Arimathea's business. He was in the tin mines and the trading metal work from Britain, the raw ores, manufacturing them. So I think Christ also had some really good connections in Parthia, didn't he? Remember those Magi and wise men? They'd have still been there. And uh, indeed, Christ himself said in Matthew 15:24, I am not sent, but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. I think he went there between age 12 and 30. The Father had sent him. I think he went. 
And also, when he picked 12 disciples, remember, to be the apostles, you know, he called Peter to be a fisher of men and the rest of them. He, how would he, you know, he also told them later that each of them was going to rule one of the tribes of Israel, right? He, he picked people not just to be disciples. He was thinking with a lot longer time horizon than just starting his church. He was thinking in the millennium, one, each of these guys is going to have to be ruling over a tribe of Israel for a thousand years and longer after that. So, he had to know those tribes to know what kind of a man, what kind of temperament, what kind of characteristics would be the best to rule over a particular tribe. He was picking his executive team. So when he, we picked them, I believe he had gone and visited all the tribes of Israel. Parthia, Scythia, in Great Britain would have been totally open to him. I even make uh, the possible case that, there was, that he could have gone to the New World where we know there was a lot of Israelites. The early Quetzalcoatl legends of the Mayans say that their first Quetzalcoatl was a human. He was white. He had come from the east. He was the son of God. He was born of a virgin. He was going back to sacrifice himself. He became the morning star. He died, was resurrected, and went to heaven. Who does that sound like? You know, so anyway, Christ could easily have been over here. And we know that the, the trade routes brought goods over because there's, there's Jewish coins that have been found in Kentucky, Tennessee, and the Ozarks area that are from the Jewish Second Temple period, and they date them to around the 1st or 2nd century A.D. You know, the, the Jews had people that fled the Romans as well during the Bar Kokhba rebellion and also at the time of Titus when he sacked Jerusalem in 70 A.D. Some of them ended up in, in the early America. So uh, with those kinds of legends, when, when the Bible says that Christ grew in stature and favor with God and man, it was all over, but not in Judea at that particular time. Okay, early English history also records that Joseph of Arimathea was given 12 hides of land by a Celtic king there, and that Joseph, Jesus, and their party were reputed to have had residences there. More evidence is that in my, is in my book, but I've got to move on. To close this point, John 21-25 has a passage where it states that if all the works of Jesus were written in the books, the world itself couldn't contain the volumes. Now, I'm sure that you know the Bible is literature, Writers use hyperbole. Okay, I think the, you know literally the earth could have held the books. But what he's saying is that there is so much more about Jesus' life than what they wrote in the eyewitness gospel accounts. Remember, many times they wrote that they were eyewitnesses of these things, you know, in the four gospels, or also in the book of Acts, etc. They were eyewitnesses. So they were eyewitnesses of Christ's ministry to Judah, to Judea, in about you know the three and a half years of his life when he was there. They were not eyewitnesses of what happened when he was gone between ages 12 and 30, so they didn't write about it. But they referred to it where John said he had grown in grace and stature with men everywhere, and also that he had done so much, there was so much more than what they had written in their Gospels. There's even a uh, record from Eusebius that a Parthian ruler had invited Jesus to come to Parthia, that the Parthians kept track of Jesus, that uh, they knew he was being given ill treatment by the Jews. One Parthian sub-king wrote to be healed, and Christ Mind this, Eusebius claims that he saw the letter from Jesus to the Parthian ruler saying that after he was, you know, he, had, he couldn't leave, he had to stay to finish his, his mission or life's work, I forget what it was, but he would send an apostle to heal the king of his disease. And it's in the Parthian records that he did. And uh, also Parthia substantially became Christianized in the apostolic area, in the era. Armenia, one of the Parthian provinces, became Christian as its state religion in 301 A.D., before any Roman place did. So Parthia was actually more uh, receptive to Christianity by far than was Rome. Well, the final Parthian-Roman war was one of the bloodiest in human history. The tribes of Israel against the Roman Empire. Rome's emperor in 215, a particularly wicked man named Caracalus, even the Romans say he was they, 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 a viper, a terrible, they have nothing good to say about him, proposed marrying one of the Parthian princesses, the daughter of the emperor of Parthia. This would make the emperor of Parthia his father-in-law, and of course it would be a new era of peace. It was glasnost, it was perestroika. You know, in the ancient Roman, you to put modern terms on their relationships. And just as an aside, by the way, if, if, if people were to, to get the idea between the difference of Parthia and Rome, if archaeologists were to dig up our 20th century, 3,000 years into the future, 2,000, how accurate a picture would they have of our period if they, de- if they wrote all of it from the standpoint of the Soviet Union? If they dug up the Soviet records in Moscow and they came across, oh, this is the truth, what happened? 
And then they learned about what terrible hegemonists and imperialists the United States was. And uh, they wrote their history books based on the, the civilizing influence of the People's Republic of China and Russia. And about those terrible barbarian Americans, British and Germans and so forth. You know, but that's what happened in the ancient world, people. It really did. We've dug up the propaganda of Roman and Romans and made it history. But uh, anyway, Parthia was weary of war. And it really is a commentary on the Israelite mind's ability to blind itself when uh, they just get weary of everything. They wanted to believe it, so they did. They had Parthia's capital decorated and festooned, you know, with ribbons and banners and everything, welcoming their Roman friends for the great wedding. Well, the Roman emperor had brought one of the biggest Roman empires, one of the biggest armies ever to Parthia. It seemed a little big. But anyway, Parthia said, no, they wouldn't lie to us. They're good guys now. And uh, I think there's a parallel there even to our modern world. Sometimes I wonder if the Russians really are such great comrades. Especially the new guy who's from the KGB saying he wants to remilitarize. But that's an aside. <laughs> Parthia then welcomed them, and just as the wedding was to begin, Rome's army got the word and they started slaughtering all the unsuspecting Parthians. Parthia's emperor barely escaped with his life. The Romans then did something that made the Parthians really mad. And they uh, desecrated the bones of Parthia's kings, which were virtually worshipped at that particular time. That was the seat of David, remember? The seat of Perez. So they desecrated all of David's seed, and uh, the Parthian emperor then launched a war of total annihilation against Rome's forces at that point. I don't think Rome, and I'm not the only one to say this, some of the historians have said too, that they don't think Rome ever really realized how big Parthia was, that it went all the way to India, the Indus River and beyond with Saka kingdoms and their related tribes clear up into the Scythian areas of Russia, and I'm sure some of you have read about it or seen it. Again, the Learning or Discovery Channel have had about the Scythian tombs with gold in the, in the Altai Mountains, you know, in that region where, good, you know, I see some people have seen this. In, uh, yeah, another one, and uh, so another, I right, great. So anyway, uh, it's always good when you know you've got an audience that understands what you're talking about on something. Huh? But remember, they dug up the, uh, particularly, they dug up one of the embalmed bodies of a female that might have been a queen. They're buried with her horses and so forth, obviously a Caucasian, what if it was Queen Tamaris who had beaten Cyrus the Great? But the Scythian tombs are phenomenal with gold work and incredible wealth, some of these. And uh, also National Geographic has done stories on these Scythian tombs that were unearthed up in that area. And they were all Israelite people, although they don't call them that, of course. But uh, anyway, this time the Parthian emperor gathered his troops from the entire empire and marched on the Romans. The Romans had the attitude of, oops. And so they killed their bad emperor. And they, they got a new emperor, and they said, okay, we're good guys. We really are this time. And, and uh, they even offered to make payment, you know, of a certain amount of money. And the Parthians said, nope, we're here to kill you. And so the only acceptable alternative is dead Romans all over the place. So they were absolutely furious. And it was one of the largest battles in all of human history. It was at the area of Nisibis, which is on the Turkey-Syria border. It was a war of annihilation. The Greeks and the Romans mentioned an awful lot about the tactics and what happened in this war. It was one of the major events in their empire. They talk about the incredible uh, cavalries the Parthia sent mounted on both camels and horses with their knights. The Romans had tried to develop a countermeasure. They, had, they made iron balls with barbs on them, you know, points. And they'd throw it out in front of the cavalry hoping to break the hooves, you know, of the horses and dehorse de the riders. And uh, for three days, the Roman record said, the battle went on nonstop. It said the dead were so many that, you could, that it impeded the maneuvers of the troops. There were so many dead bodies. But Parthia won. Rome had to return all the captives and booty taken from Parthia. They paid a war indemnity to Parthia, which almost broke the Roman treasury. Parthia was depleted by the war, though. It was a pyrrhic victory for them. And in 220 A.D., just a few years later, per Persia revolted from Parthia and they defeated the Parthians. Now, the Parthians had become Semitic in religion, in character. They put Semitic slogans on their coins. They had re-identified re with their Semitic background. And uh, the Persians were Zoroastrians. They hated everything Semitic. And when they got the upper hand, they pushed all the Parthians out of Asia. It was a jihad, if I can call it that. And uh, the Parthians and Sake quickly disappeared from Asia. Well, where did they go? They're, they... Their empire perished about 225 A.D., and in the decades and centuries after that, we see 
that many people are pouring into Europe. You know, the Germans, the Goths, the Saxons, which carried the name of the Sake, the seat of Isaac. Even the names uh, Kermania or Germania or Germany, that, that's in ancient Persia. So the German tribes were there too, even called that by the Romans when they came pouring in there. The Gothi were in uh, the area of the Black Sea, which of course were the Goths. So these were the Israelite people pouring into Europe looking for new homelands because they had their wives and children with them. I mean, you don't bring your wives and children to war, do you? Unless you're desperate for a new homeland. Armenia was the only Parthian province which resisted the Persians. That stayed independent. So it was a magnet and a gateway for all of the people of Parthia to flow through the Caucasus Mountains into the Black Sea and into Europe, which from now they've been called the Caucasians ever since because of where they migrated through. Just a little bit of information on the Goths. They were not only Israelite, but Christian. They were Aryan Christians, but uh, they had a Bible in their tongue as early as 383 A.D. We know the Goths had 2 Corinthians, portions of all of the Gospels. They had all of Paul's letters. They had Ezra, Nehemiah. So these were a Christian people. And uh, the Saxon, Gothic, and Germanic people settling in Britain and Europe were the descendants of the old kingdom of Israel that had gone into Asia, joining with and fighting with the Celtic descendants of the old colonies of Israel that had been in Europe previous to this. And so it was, but you can see God's hand, like a shepherd, herding his people to where he wanted them in the latter days so they would be where they would be in, when Genesis 49's prophecies had to be kept. I'm going to give just some information on the uh, modern identities of the tribes. And if anybody has any questions on other tribes, I, I've got material where I can answer that, but I want to give the main ones. Uh, where are they today? Well, for those of you who are familiar with the old identifications of the Worldwide Church of God or CGI, I think 10 of the 12 were right. I only disagree on Gad and Asher. On Ephraim and Manasseh, we know God's promises to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob were passed to Ephraim and Manasseh. Genesis 48 says they were to become a nation and a company of nations, and I know there's a lot of sophisticated knowledge about this in this audience, so I don't have to go into all of it. But the United States and Britain have come from the Saxon people, named after Isaac, which, uh, of course, Israel, when he blessed them, said the name of Isaac will be on them as well. They've inherited the promises of prosperity, numbers, the gates of their enemies. They fulfill the one major nation and a grouping or commonwealth or company of nations for Ephraim. I believe the United States is Manasseh, and that Britain, Canada, Australia, New Zealand are certainly Ephraim. Now, some of the churches of God have the question of whether it's the reverse, whether the British are Manasseh and we're Ephraim. I've seen that and been asked that a lot of times. The preponderance of evidence, though, I think, supports the fact that we're Manasseh. I'll give you a few reasons. Genesis 49 shows that, that Ephraim received the first blessing from Jacob, and the primary blessing. Remember, he crossed his hands, and Joseph had displeased him, and he tried to reverse it, because he knew Manasseh was the oldest, and the right hand was supposed to go on the head of the, the oldest son. And Jacob said, no, this is of the Lord. So Ephraim had the primary or first blessing. Manasseh was literally grandfathered in by grandfather Jacob, which may be where the expression comes from. But anyway, uh, in world history, the British Empire rose to prominence first and was prominent a lot longer than we have been. I mean, the United States rose to world dominance really after World War II. The British were there for centuries. And so Ephraim really had the dominant blessing, and they had the first blessing. Manassas came second, and that's the right order. Also, since Ephraim received the major blessing, or primary, primarily what would have been Joseph's lot, but Manasseh was brought in as an extra tribe in Israel. Israel was, or excuse me, Manasseh was essentially the 13th tribe. And the number 13 was stamped on our early country, wasn't it? 13 tribes, or excuse me, 13 colonies, 13 stripes in our flag, 13 letters in Epurbus Unum. And certainly there's a lot of intermarriage and the tribes are mingled. So we're just dealing with the dominant thread here. But I believe God stamped 13 on our original country so it was hard to miss that it. it was Manasseh. He even made, made it a physical copy. In ancient Israel, on your biblical atlases, you'll see that the Manassites had more territory than any other tribe. In fact, almost as much as the rest of them put together. They had a large area east and west of the Jordan River. Half, half of the nation was on one side, half on the other. The United States is split right down by the Mississippi River. Half the nation's on the one side, half the nation is on the other. Just like the physical territory of ancient Manasseh. And uh, Manasseh likes wide open spaces and to stay in one spot. The Scythians, the Massagetai, had a huge expanse of territory and stayed together. 
Britain, on the other hand, the Ephraimites have a small homeland in Colonite. If you look at your biblical atlases, you'll see that Ephraim had a very small inheritance in ancient, in ancient Palestine. Since they were one of the birthright tribes promised to be one of the biggest in population, that doesn't make sense. Manasseh got a huge portion. Well, the Ephraimites used that as their headquarters, but they sent lots of colonists to Carthage and around the Mediterranean and Great Britain, etc. So they, ex they export their population. If we look in the modern world, the British have exported their population from a small homeland that's the Ephraimite character, whereas the United States is one single group altogether. Uh, Deuteronomy 33.17, I think, is misunderstood by those who think we're Ephraim and vice versa. That's the one I've seen quoted in a lot of their literature. Speaking of Joseph in a prophecy, it says, He shall push the people together to the ends of the earth, and they are the ten thousands of Ephraim and the thousands of Manasseh. And they say, aha, see, Ephraim has to have more people. It has to be a bigger country. But really, when you look at this, this is not a prophecy about the populations of Ephraim and Manasseh. There's no way Manasseh would have one-tenth the population of Ephraim. They were very similar in all of the ancient censuses. But what it is a prophecy is about is the number of people that will be driven together, in other words, pushed back, colonized by Ephraim and Manasseh. What it's prophesying is that Ephraim's empire is going to be about ten times the size of Manasseh's. And that's true. I mean, the sun never set on the British Empire. We had the Cuba, the Philippines, various islands, uh, protectorates, the Panama Canal Zone, but Britain had Egypt, Suez, much of the Arab world, half of Africa, India, Pakistan, Bangladesh. I mean, they had immense numbers of people living under the British flag for the longest time. And this prophecy proclaimed that Ephraim would have a lot more people living under its standard than Manasseh, which has happened. Now I want to discuss Judah. This comes up absolutely everywhere, so I just included in my speech now. Uh, I believe the Jews constitute Judah and portions of Levi. There's three prophecies in, in the Bible, and I know there's all kinds of literature out there that the Jews are not Judah. They're Edomites, or they're Khazars, or God forbid, the serpent seed, which doesn't even deserve merit. It's such a bizarre idea. But anyway, I'm confronted with this regularly, and sometimes, sometimes there's even hecklers, so I'm ready for you now if there's anyone here. <laughs> but anyway, uh, there's three prophecies I want to discuss, because when we identify who Judah is in the latter days, here's the final vote. This is my light Bible. It's a travel one, so it doesn't take much weight on an airplane. But God has the final vote. And so anyway, in Zephaniah 2, in verse 7, it says, The coast, this is of Palestine, shall be for the remnant of Judah in the latter days. It's just before the day of the Lord. So Judah is going to have to be located in the old cities of Ashkelon and Gaza and so forth. Well, that's the, that's the seacoast strip they started out with in the protectorate when the British left the British Mandate in 1948. They were right along that seacoast. And this is in the latter days. Also, Genesis 49 says that Judah, in the latter days, will be a lion's whelp over its prey. They're going to be a, a young nation. A whelp is a cub. Is, are the Israelis a young nation? Yes, they started in 1948. They weren't a nation for many, many centuries. And they have been militaristic. They've been like a lion, defeating their neighboring nations. So they've been like a young lion. They're uh, also in Zechariah 12. It prophesies that when Christ comes, well, the Messiah, Judah will not accept Christ as the Messiah until he comes as the conquering Messiah. Then it says that they will set themselves apart and mourn for him who they have pierced. You know, the piercing that Christ went through on the cross. But it says that Judah is not going to accept him until, or recognize him until he comes as the conquering Messiah. So, you, the, Jew, the people of Judah have to be a non-Christian nation. Well, you have the Jews, they're a non-Christian nation. So, in the latter days, you need a young nation in Palestine, bearing the name of, the, of Judah, strong military, wins wars, they're non-Christian. This is a no-brainer, folks. I mean, it's the Jewish state. And so, you can have all the arguments you want about what human beings have written about who's a Jew and who isn't. I'm up here with it, frankly. And the, the fact is... God picked who was Judah when he picked them to fulfill the prophecies about Judah in the latter days. God used the Sephardic and Ashkenazi Jews to fulfill the prophecies about Judah. And as far as I'm concerned, that settles the issue. Now, let's read do some of the arguments, though, because I know it doesn't settle the issue with a lot of people. But I want you to know this, because I have run into, I have all kinds of good friends that now think that they're more righteous the more they hate the Jews. Really? And I'm sure you, some of you have seen this stuff too. Don't believe it. 
For example, if I had a blackboard, I'd write the term Ashkenazi Jew. Okay, Ashkenazi, just picture it up there on the board. And they say, well, those are the ancient Khazars. And yes, a lot of them from the Khazar Empire. There's no question about that. That's very true. And a lot of Edomites did join themselves to Judah. There's no question about that either. I mean, that's written about in Josephus. And a lot of them became like Jews and submitted to circumcision. We know that a lot of different bloodlines have been a part of Judah. But now right under Ashkenazi, I would write the Persian word for Parthia, which is Ashkan. So the Ashkenazi Jews are bearing the Persian name for Parthia, which Parthia had more of the tribe of Judah in it than Judea ever did. Remember, Ezra and Nehemiah was just a small remnant that came back to Judah or to Jerusalem. That's what the population base was for Judea in the time of Christ. There was far more Jews in, in Parthia. And so the Ashkenazi Jews, when they came into Europe, were bearing the name of Parthia on them, and they're declaring to this day that they are the descendants of the Parthian Jews. Remember, a lot of bloodlines joined Judah. Remember in the time of Mordecai and Esther? It says at the end of that book of Esther, it says, many people feared the Jews and became Jews in all the 129 satrapies or whatever. So you had every, nom every, every ling linguistic and racial group in Persia, many of them joined the Jews. And God says in Esther, they became Jews. It doesn't say they were imposters. They became Jews. Josephus says the same thing. The preceding message was taken from the World Wide Website at address www.biblestudy.org. This site is sponsored by Barnabas Ministries. Bible Study. You have questions? The Bible has answers.